The acme of self-control is reached and best illustrated in the first of the two institutions which we shall now bring to view, namely, the institutions of suicide and redress, of which the former known as harakiri and the latter as katakiuchi. Many foreign writers have treated more or less fully. To begin with suicide, let me state that I confine my observations only to seppuku or kapuku, popularly known as harakiri, which means self-immolation by disembowelment. Ripping the abdomen? How absurd! So cry those to whom the name is new. Absurdly odd, as it may sound at first to foreign ears, it cannot be so very foreign to students of Shakespeare, who puts these words in Brutus's mouth. Thy, that is Caesar's, spirit walks abroad and turns our swords into our proper entrails. Listen to a modern English poet who in his Light of Asia speaks of a sword piercing the bowels of a queen. None blames him for bad English or breach of modesty. Or, to take still another example, look at Guercino's painting of Cato's death in the Palazzo Rosa in Genoa. Whoever has read the swan song which Addison makes Cato sing will not jeer at the sword half buried in his abdomen. In our minds this mode of death is associated with instances of noblest deeds and of most touching pathos, so that nothing repugnant, much less ludicrous, mars our conception of it. So wonderful is the transforming power of virtue, of greatness, of tenderness, that the vilest form of death assumes a sublimity and becomes a symbol of new life. Or else, the sign which Constantine beheld would not conquer the world. Not for extraneous associations only does seppuku lose in our mind any taint of absurdity. For the choice of this particular part of the body to operate upon was based on an old anatomical belief as to the seat of the soul and of the affections. When Moses wrote of Joseph's bowels yearning upon his brother, or David prayed the Lord not to forget his bowels, or when Isaiah, Jeremiah, or other inspired men of old spoke of the sounding or the troubling of bowels, they all and each endorsed the belief prevalent among the Japanese that in the abdomen was enshrined the soul. The Semites habitually spoke of the liver and kidneys and surrounding fat as the seat of emotion and of life. The term hara was more comprehensive than the Greek phren or tumos, and the Japanese and Hellenes alike thought the spirit of man to dwell somewhere in that region. Such a notion is by no means confined to the peoples of antiquity. The French, in spite of the theory propounded by one of their most distinguished philosophers, Descartes, that the soul is located in the pineal gland, still insist in using the term ventre in a sense which, if anatomically too vague, is nevertheless physiologically significant. Similarly, entrails stands in their language for affection and compassion. Nor is such belief mere superstition being more scientific than the general idea of making the heart the center of the feelings. Without asking a friar, the Japanese knew better than Romeo in what vile part of this anatomy one's name did lodge. Modern neurologists speak of the abdominal and pelvic brains, denoting thereby sympathetic nerve centers in those parts which are strongly affected by any psychical action. This view of mental physiology once admitted, the syllogism of seppuku is easy to construct. I will open the seat of my soul and show you how it fares with it. See for yourself whether it is polluted or clean. I do not wish to be understood as asserting religious or even moral justification of suicide, but the high estimate placed upon honor was ample excuse with many for taking one's own life. How many acquiesced in the sentiment expressed by Garth, When honor's lost, tis a relief to die. Death's but a sure retreat from infamy. 
and have smilingly surrendered their souls to oblivion. Death, when honor was involved, was accepted in Bushido as a key to the solution of many complex problems, so that to an ambitious samurai, a natural departure from life seemed a rather tame affair and a consummation not devoutly to be wished for. I dare say that many good Christians, if only they are honest enough, will confess the fascination of, if not positive admiration for, the sublime composure with which Cato, Brutus, Petronius, and a host of other ancient worthies terminated their own earthly existence. Is it too bold to hint that the death of the first of the philosophers was partly suicidal? When we are told so minutely by his pupils how their master willingly submitted to the mandate of the state, which he knew was morally mistaken, in spite of the possibilities of escape, and how he took up the cup of hemlock in his own hand, even offering libation from its deadly contents. Do we not discern in his whole proceeding and demeanor an act of self-immolation? No physical compulsion here, as in ordinary cases of execution. True, the verdict of the judges was compulsory. It said, Thou shalt die, and that by thy own hand. If suicide meant no more than dying by one's own hand, Socrates was a clear case of suicide. But nobody would charge him with the crime. Plato, who was averse to it, would not call his master a suicide. Now, my readers will understand that seppuku was not a mere suicidal process. It was an institution, legal and ceremonial. An invention of the Middle Ages, it was a process by which warriors could expiate their crimes, apologize for errors, escape from disgrace, redeem their friends, or prove their sincerity. When enforced as a legal punishment, it was practiced with due ceremony. It was a refinement of self-destruction, and none could perform it without the utmost coolness of temper and composure of demeanor, and for these reasons it was particularly befitting the profession of Bushi. Antiquarian curiosity, if nothing else, would tempt me to give here a description of this obsolete ceremonial, but seeing that such a description was made by a far abler writer, whose book is not much read nowadays, I am tempted to make a somewhat lengthy quotation. Mitford, in his Tales of Old Japan, after giving a translation of a treatise on seppuku from a rare Japanese manuscript, goes on to describe an instance of such an execution of which he was an eyewitness. We, seven foreign representatives, were invited to follow the Japanese witness into the hondo, or main hall of the temple, where the ceremony was to be performed. It was an imposing scene a large hall with a high roof supported by dark pillars of wood. From the ceiling hung a profusion of those huge gilt lamps and ornaments peculiar to Buddhist temples. In front of the high altar, where the floor, covered with beautiful white mats, is raised some three or four inches from the ground, was laid a rug of scarlet felt. Tall candles placed at regular intervals gave out a dim, mysterious light just sufficient to let all the proceedings be seen. The seven Japanese took their places on the left of the raised floor, the seven foreigners on the right. No other person was present. After the interval of a few minutes of anxious suspense, Taki Zenzaburo, a stalwart man thirty-two years of age with a noble air, walked into the hall attired in his dress of ceremony with the peculiar hempen cloth wings which are worn on great occasions. He was accompanied by a kaishaku and three officers who wore the jimbaori, or war surcoat, with gold tissue facings. The word kaishaku, it should be observed, is one to which our word executioner is no equivalent term. The office is that of a gentleman, in many cases it is performed by a kinsman or friend of the condemned, and the relation between them is rather that of a principal and second than that of victim and executioner. In this instance the kaishaku was a pupil of Takisenzaburo, and was selected by friends of the latter from among their own number for his skill in swordsmanship. 
with the kaishaku on his left hand, Takizenzaburo advanced slowly towards the Japanese witnesses, and the two bowed before them. Then, drawing near to the foreigners, they saluted us in the same way, perhaps even with more deference. In each case, the salutation was ceremoniously returned. Slowly and with great dignity, the condemned man mounted onto the raised floor, prostrated himself before the high altar twice, and seated himself on the thick carpet with his back to the high altar, the kaishaku couching on his left hand side. In seating himself, that is, in the Japanese fashion, his knees and toes touching the ground and his body resting on his heels. In this position, which is one of respect, he remained until his death. One of the three attendant officers then came forward, bearing a stand of the kind used in the temple for offerings, on which, wrapped in paper, lay the wakizashi, the short sword or dirk of the Japanese, nine inches and a half in length, with a point and an edge as sharp as a razor's. This he handed, prostrating himself, to the condemned man who received it reverently, raising it to his head with both hands, and placed it in front of himself. After another profound obeisance, Takizenzaburo, in a voice which betrayed just so much emotion and hesitation as might be expected from a man who is making a painful confession, but with no sign of either in his face or manner, spoke as follows. I, and I alone, unwarrantably gave the order to fire on the foreigners at Kobe, and again as they tried to escape. For this crime I disembowel myself, and I beg you who are present to do me the honor of witnessing the act. Bowing once more, the speaker allowed his upper garments to slip down to his girdle and remained naked to the waist. Carefully, according to custom, he tucked his sleeves under his knees to prevent himself from falling backward, for a noble Japanese gentleman should die falling forwards. Deliberately, with a steady hand, he took the dirk that lay before him. He looked at it wistfully, almost affectionately, for a moment he seemed to collect his thoughts for the last time, and then, stabbing himself deeply below the waist, in the left-hand side, he drew the dirk slowly across to his right side, and turning it in the wound, gave a slight cut upwards. During this sickeningly painful operation he never moved a muscle of his face. When he drew out the dirk, he leaned forward and stretched out his neck, an expression of pain for the first time crossed his face, but he uttered no sound. At that moment the kaishaku, who still crouching by his side had been keenly watching his every movement, sprang to his feet, poised his sword for a second in the air. There was a flash, a heavy, ugly thud, a crashing fall. With one blow the head had been severed from the body. A dead silence followed, broken only by the hideous noise of the blood throbbing out of the inert head before us, which but a moment before had been a brave and chivalrous man. It was horrible. The kaishaku made a low bow, wiped his sword with a piece of paper which he had ready for the purpose, and retired from the raised floor, and the stained dirk was solemnly borne away, a bloody proof of the execution. The two representatives of the Mikado then left their places and, crossing over to where the foreign witnesses sat, called to us to witness that the sentence of death upon Takizenzaburo had been faithfully carried out. The ceremony being at an end, we left the temple. I might multiply any number of descriptions of seppuku, from literature or from the relation of eyewitnesses, but one more instance will suffice. Two brothers, Sakon and Naiki, respectively twenty-four and seventeen years of age, made an effort to kill Ieyasu in order to avenge their father's wrongs, but before they could enter the camp they were made prisoners. The old general admired the pluck of the youths who dared an attempt on his life and ordered that they should be allowed to die an honorable death. Their little brother, Hachimaro, 
a mere infant of eight summers was condemned to a similar fate, as the sentence was pronounced on all the male members of the family, and the three were taken to a monastery where it was to be executed. A physician who was present on the occasion has left us a diary from which the following scene is translated. When they were all seated in a row for final dispatch, Sakon turned to the youngest and said, Go thou first, for I wish to be sure that thou doest it aright. Upon the little ones replying that as he had never seen seppuku performed, he would like to see his brothers do it, and then he could follow them, the older brothers smiled between their tears. Well said, little fellow. So canst thou well boast of being our father's child. When they had placed him between them, Sakon thrust the dagger into the left side of his own abdomen and asked, Look, brother, dost understand now? Only don't push the dagger too far, lest thou fall back. Lean forward, brother, and keep thy knees well composed. Naiki did likewise and said to the boy, Keep thy eyes open, or else thou mayest look like a dying woman. If thy dagger feels anything within, and thy strength fails, take courage and double thy effort to cut across. The child looked from one to the other, and when both had expired, he calmly half denuded himself, and followed the example set him on either hand. The glorification of seppuku offered, naturally enough, no small temptation to its unwarranted committal. For causes entirely incompatible with reason, or for reasons entirely undeserving of death, hot-headed youths rushed into it as insects fly into fire. Mixed and dubious motives drove more samurai to this deed than nuns into convent gates. Life was cheap, cheap as reckoned by the popular standard of honor. The saddest feature was that honor, which was always in the agio, so to speak, was not always solid gold but alloyed with baser metals. No one circle in the inferno will boast of greater density of Japanese population than the seventh, to which Dante consigns all victims of self-destruction. And yet, for a true samurai to hasten death or to court it was alike cowardice. A typical fighter, when he lost battle after battle and was pursued from plain to hill and from bush to cavern, found himself hungry and alone in the dark hollow of a tree, his sword blunt with use, his bow broken and arrows exhausted. Did not the noblest of Romans fall upon his own sword in Philippi under like circumstances? He deemed it cowardly to die, but with a fortitude approaching a Christian martyr's, cheered himself with an impromptu verse. Come, evermore come, ye dread sorrows and pains, and heap on my burdened back, that I not one test may lack of what strength in me remains. This, then, was the Bushido teaching. Bear and face all calamities and adversities with patience and a pure conscience. For as Mencius taught, When heaven is about to confer a great office on anyone, it first exercises his mind with suffering and his sinews and bones with toil. It exposes his body to hunger and subjects him to extreme poverty, and it confounds his undertakings. In all these ways it stimulates his mind, hardens his nature, and supplies his incompetencies. True honor lies in fulfilling heaven's decree and no death incurred in so doing is ignominious, whereas death to avoid what heaven has in store is cowardly indeed. In that quaint book of Sir Thomas Brown's Religio Medici, there is an exact English equivalent for what is repeatedly taught in our precepts. Let me quote it. It is a brave act of valor to contemn death. But where life is more terrible than death, it is then the truest valor to dare to live. A renowned priest of the seventeenth century satirically observed, Talk as he may, a samurai who ne'er has died is apt in decisive moments to flee or hide. Again, him who once has died in the bottom of his breast, 
no spears of Sanada nor all the arrows of Tametomo can pierce. How near we come to the portals of the temple whose builder taught, He that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. These are but a few of the numerous examples which tend to confirm the moral identity of the human species. Notwithstanding an attempt so assiduously made to render the distinction between Christian and pagan as great as possible. We have thus seen that the Bushido institution of suicide was neither so irrational nor barbarous as its abuse strikes us at first sight. We will now see whether its sister institution of redress, or call it revenge, if you will, has its mitigating features. I hope I can dispose of this question in a few words, since a similar institution, or call it custom if that suits you better, has at some time prevailed among all peoples, and has not yet become entirely obsolete, as attested by the continuance of dueling and lynching. Why, has not an American captain recently challenged, Esther Hazy, that the wrongs of Dreyfus be avenged? Among a savage tribe which has no marriage, adultery is not a sin, and only the jealousy of a lover protects a woman from abuse. So in a time which has no criminal court, murder is not a crime, and only the vigilant vengeance of the victim's people preserves social order. What is the most beautiful thing on earth, said Osiris to Horus, The reply was, to avenge a parent's wrongs, to which a Japanese would have added, and a master's. In revenge there is something which satisfies one's sense of justice. The avenger reasons, my good father did not deserve death. He who killed him did great evil. My father, if he were alive, would not tolerate a deed like this. Heaven itself hates wrongdoing. It is the will of my Father, it is the will of heaven, that the evildoer cease from his work. He must perish by my hand because he shed my Father's blood. I, who am his flesh and blood, must shed the murderers. The same heaven shall not shelter him and me. The ratiocination is simple and childish though we know Hamlet did not reason much more deeply. Nevertheless, it shows an innate sense of exact balance and equal justice, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Our sense of revenge is as exact as our mathematical faculty, and until both terms of the equation are satisfied, we cannot get over the sense of something left undone. In Judaism, which believed in a jealous God, or in Greek mythology which provided a nemesis, vengeance may be left to superhuman agencies. But common sense furnished Bushido with the institution of redress as a kind of ethical court of equity, where people could take cases not to be judged in accordance with ordinary law. The master of the forty-seven ronins was condemned to death. He had no court of higher instance to appeal to. His faithful retainers addressed themselves to vengeance, the only supreme court existing. They, in their turn, were condemned by common law. But the popular instinct passed a different judgment, and hence their memory is still kept as green and fragrant as are their graves at Sengakuji to this day. Though Lao Tzu taught to recompense injury with kindness, the voice of Confucius was very much louder which counseled that injury must be recompensed with justice. And yet revenge was justified only when it was undertaken in behalf of our superiors and benefactors. One's own wrongs, including injuries done to wife and children, were to be borne and forgiven. A samurai could therefore fully sympathize with Hannibal's oath to avenge his country's wrongs but he scorns James Hamilton for wearing in his girdle a handful of earth from his wife's grave as an eternal incentive to avenge her wrongs on the Regent Murray. Both of these institutions of suicide and redress lost their raison d'etre 
at the promulgation of the criminal code. No more do we hear of romantic adventures of a fair maiden as she tracks in disguise the murderer of her parent. No more can we witness tragedies of family vendetta enacted. The knight errantry of Miyamoto Musashi is now a tale of the past. The well-ordered police spies out the criminal for the injured party and the law meets out justice. The whole state and society will see that wrong is righted. The sense of justice satisfied, there is no need of Kotaki Uchi. If this had meant that hunger of the heart, which feeds upon the hope of glutting that hunger with the lifeblood of the victim, as a New England divine has described it, a few paragraphs in the criminal code would not so entirely have made an end of it. As to seppuku, though it too has no existence de jure, we still hear of it from time to time, and shall continue to hear, I am afraid, as long as the past is remembered. Many painless and time-saving methods of self-immolation will come in vogue as its votaries are increasing with fearful rapidity throughout the world. But Professor Morselli will have to concede to seppuku an aristocratic position among them. He maintains that when suicide is accomplished by very painful means or at the cost of prolonged agony, in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred it may be assigned as the act of a mind disordered by fanaticism, by madness, or by morbid excitement. But a normal seppuku does not savor of fanaticism, or madness, or excitement, but most sang being necessary to its successful accomplishment. Of the two kinds into which Dr. Strahan divides suicide, the rational, or quasi, and the irrational, or true, seppuku is the best example of the former type. From these bloody institutions, as well as from the general tenor of Bushido, it is easy to infer that the sword played an important part in social discipline and life. The saying passed us an axiom, which called the sword, the soul of the samurai, and made it the emblem of power and prowess. When Muhammad proclaimed that the sword is the key of heaven and of hell, he only echoed a Japanese sentiment. Very early, the samurai boy learned to wield it. It was a momentous occasion for him when at the age of five he was apparelled in the paraphernalia of samurai costume, placed upon a go-board, and initiated into the rites of the military profession by having thrust into his girdle a real sword instead of the toy dirk with which he had been playing. After this first ceremony of adoptio per arma, he was no more to be seen outside of his father's gates without this badge of a status even if it was usually substituted for everyday wear by a gilded wooden dirk. Not many years pass before he wears constantly the genuine steel, though blunt, and then the sham arms are thrown aside, and with enjoyment keener than his newly acquired blades he marches out to try their edge on wood and stone. When he reaches man's estate at the age of fifteen being given independence of action, he can now pride himself upon the possession of arms sharp enough for any work. The very possession of the dangerous instrument imparts to him a feeling and an air of self-respect and responsibility. He beareth not his sword in vain. What he carries in his belt is a symbol of what he carries in his mind and heart. Loyalty and honor. The two swords the longer and the shorter, called respectively Daito and Shoto, or Katana and Wakizashi, never leave his side. When at home they grace the most conspicuous place in study or parlor, by night they guard his pillow within easy reach of his hand. Constant companions, they are beloved, and proper names of endearment given them. Being venerated, they are well-nigh worshipped. The father of history has recorded as a curious piece of information that the Scythians sacrificed to an iron scimitar. 
many a temple and many a family in Japan hoards a sword as an object of adoration. Even the commonest dirk has due respect paid to it. Any insult to it is tantamount to personal affront. Woe to him who carelessly steps over a weapon lying on the floor. So precious an object cannot long escape the notice and the skill of artists, nor the vanity of its owner, especially in times of peace when it is worn with no more use than a crozier by a bishop or a scepter by a king. Shark skin and finest silk for hilt, silver and gold for guard, lacquer of varied hues for scabbard, robbed the deadliest weapon of half its terror. But these appurtenances are playthings compared with the blade itself. The swordsmith was not a mere artisan, but an inspired artist, and his workshop a sanctuary. Daily he commenced his craft with prayer and purification, or, as the phrase was, he committed his soul and spirit into the forging and tempering of the steel. Every swing of the sledge, every plunge into water, every friction on the grindstone was a religious act of no slight import. Was it the spirit of the master or of his tutelary god that cast a formidable spell over our sword? Perfect as a work of art, setting at defiance its Toledo and Damascus rivals, there is more than art could impart its cold blade collecting on its surface the moment it is drawn the vapors of the atmosphere, its immaculate texture, flashing light of bluish hue, its matchless edge upon which histories and possibilities hang, the curve of its back uniting exquisite grace with utmost strength. All these thrill us with mixed feelings of power and beauty, of awe and terror, Harmless were its mission, if it only remained a thing of beauty and joy. But ever within the reach of the hand, it presented no small temptation for abuse. Too often did the blade flash forth from its peaceful sheath. The abuse sometimes went so far as to try the acquired steel on some harmless creature's neck. The question that concerns us most is, however, did Bushido justify the promiscuous use of the weapon? The answer is unequivocally no. As it laid great stress on its proper use, so did it denounce and abhor its misuse. A dastard or a braggart was he who brandished his weapon on undeserved occasions. A self-possessed man knows the right time to use it, and such times come but rarely. Let us listen to the late Count Katsu, who passed through one of the most turbulent times of our history, when assassinations, suicides, and other sanguinary practices were the order of the day. Endowed as he once was with almost dictatorial powers, repeatedly marked out as an object for assassination, he never tarnished his sword with blood. In relating some of his reminiscences to a friend, he says, in a quaint plebeian way peculiar to him, I have a great dislike for killing people, and so I haven't killed one single man. I have released those whose heads should have been chopped off. A friend said to me one day, You don't kill enough. Don't you eat pepper and eggplants? Well, some people are no better. But you see, that fellow was slain himself. My escape may be due to my dislike of killing. I had the hilt of my sword so tightly fastened to the scabbard that it was hard to draw the blade. I made up my mind that though they cut me, I will not cut. Yes, yes. Some people are truly like fleas and mosquitoes, and they bite, but... What does their biting amount to? It itches a little, that's all. It won't endanger life. 
These are the words of one whose Bushido training was tried in the fiery furnace of adversity and triumph. The popular apothem, to be beaten is to conquer, meaning true conquest consists in not opposing a riotous foe, and the best won victory is that obtained without shedding of blood, and others of similar import, will show that after all the ultimate ideal of knighthood was peace. It was a great pity that this high ideal was left exclusively to priests and moralists to preach, while the samurai went on practicing and extolling martial traits. In this they went so far as to tinge the ideals of womanhood with Amazonian character. Here we may profitably devote a few paragraphs to the subject of the training and position of woman.